여러분들은 안녕하십니까? 오셔서 정말 고맙습니다. 지금부터 용어를 보고 해드리겠습니다. 괜찮겠습니까? 네. 괜찮겠습니까? 네. 네. 그래서 in English, as I promised, I will continue this Dharma talk, and uh, I'm very happy to see so many happy faces today in the audience. However, the subject that I have chosen for this talk and was kindly accepted by Bujangmin will, will not be nice. It will be about suffering. Mostly in this room, during the previous 31 Saturdays, you are used to wonderful Dharma talks, very nice speech based on the Buddhas and the Patriarchs teaching. And today, although really trying to follow the great minds of old, the subject cannot be nice. Why? When the Buddha realized birth, old age, sickness and death, that was not a nice experience to him. We call that the loss of illusion. When we are born into this world, our parents make sure that we are fine. We get enough food, we get very nice little room or at least a corner, where we can sleep peacefully as a kid and of course we don't disturb our parents and as we grow up we get almost everything because the parents can give you almost everything you need never quite what you want but almost everything you need and as we grow up we begin to ask questions and that's when the answers begin to appear before that, we are just being taken care of. And as we grow up, we are supposed to be responsible adults. We are supposed to understand how this world works, how life and death work, why we are born, what our job is in this life, and why we die. When we are born, we do not get a manual for this. We do not get a piece of paper Young baby, this is your karma, this is the world, that's what you have to do. We do not get this, do we? Do you remember getting anything at the maternity ward or some special office, that, like the universal dharma office? No. That's why growing up is a painful process. And all of you in this room have already experienced loss of illusion, feeling deceived, feeling just completely being treated unfair or unjust, not by any particular person, but just by the way life is. Why? The first realization that the Buddha had when he took his trip outside of the palace, that we will all die, no matter how we love life, how we love other beings, we die. So. Since that causes so much suffering, why did we come here in the first place? Why? Why come here for such a short time, taking this very, very feeble body, taking this very impermanent and imperfect body, which is bound to so many conditions to feel good? Why? And the beauty of the answer is that no one can give it to you. You have to find it yourself. We all have a chance to wake up. As the Buddhas and the Patriarchs say, all beings have Buddha nature, and this Buddha nature is exactly the same. Our capacity to wake up is exactly the same. But everything else is different. Your face is not the same as anyone else's face in this room. Your karma is different from everybody else's karma in this room. So you have to find your own way to your own mountain where on the top you will meet other Buddhas, other enlightened beings. Even on the way up, as you get a little closer, you start to recognize, how? That's my Doban. That's my friend. That's my enemy. Because we are all going to the same place. So what can we actually do? What is our real choice? And I mean real choice. 
We have to find where suffering comes from, where life and death come from. So the Buddha, when he started to teach, he actually started with the core of the Abhatamsaka Sutra. And if you want to understand the nature of this universe, then treat it as created by mind alone. But where is that mind? What is that mind? Is your mind something locked into your skull? In every human being there's a little mind and that thinks and feels and that creates this whole world? Of course not. But how does that really work? Don't we have an individual mind which is focused on our brain and other parts of the body and the heart, as Asians believe it? Yes, it's true. You have your own individual mind, individual thinking and feelings. But you alone, or even 7 billion of us, can we create this entire universe with 28 billion light years in diameter? Who knows? Who knows? And if we do not know, we are actually halfway there. Do not know means we attain this don't know. Not knowing means we go before thinking. Why? Your thinking cannot find the answer. So maybe your no thinking can find the answer. Maybe if you don't get there, with walking, 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 because you realize you walk in circles. Thinking, question, answer, thinking, question, answer, around, around, around. Look at books, look at writings, look at human thought. We have been going in circles for thousands of years. So maybe stop. Stop and don't move. Stop and don't think. Stop and return to the mind which is before birth and death. But of course, this is pretty hard to understand, especially in the Buddha's time, about 2,500 years ago, when he started to teach, nobody understood this core teaching of the Avatamsaka Sutra. So what did he do? He made one step back, and he started to teach the Lotus Sutra, or the Four Noble Truths, in Korean, the Sa Songje. Now, the Four Noble Truths is really a clear user's manual. It's a little bit abstract, but it's concrete enough to, to get started with. So first of all, which human beings even now find very hard to acknowledge, is the fact of suffering. That suffering is universal. It's not just your discomfort. It's not just something inconvenient. It's not just a gap of information. It's deeply rooted in human existence. Human existence and suffering are simultaneous and synonymous. So is happiness. But after a while, if you live a few decades, who would want the constant up and down of happiness, suffering, happiness, suffering all the time? What's the way out? You say chulga or living home. No. Chulga is a good chance, but it's not the outside hair which you have to cut. Cut the inside hair. Cut the mind's hair. And we call that ignorance. That is the major cause of suffering, which is expounded in the second noble truth. So, it starts with ignorance, or in Sanskrit, avidya. Literally, it means not seeing. So if you do not see clearly, if you do not see cause and effect, you not only suffer, you make other people suffer. And that is terrible. That is truly and absolutely terrible. Not just the fact that you make yourself suffer, it could be contained. It's like you make a mess in your kitchen, and of course the family has to somehow address it and help clean up, but no. It goes beyond your own house. It goes to the floor below and above and to the neighbors. So the suffering you inflict does not stay with you. It's inflicted upon many other beings. And to the extent of our ignorance and not seeing, to that extent we inflict suffering 
on other beings. Well, what can we do about it? It is very clear from the links of the twelve chains in the dependent origination that uh, ignorance is just the beginning. Ignorance creates dualities of right and wrong, high and low, I and the rest of the world. So it results in many, many grades of dualistic existence and this dualistic existence, once you wake up, what that is, that's your first awakening. What kind of world we are really living in? And that dualistic existence is going back to your dualistic thinking or dualistic emotions. And then the end of suffering, consequently, is something non-dualistic. Something beyond thought something beyond dualistic concepts. And the way there is kind of the reverse of the twelve links in the chain of dependent originations. I mean, Mahayana put there the Noble Eightfold Path, which is a pretty good user's manual, you know, correct livelihood, correct meditation, correct views, correct energy, etc., etc. You can study that. You know that. But how do you get there? How do you attain that? And that's when we start to practice. Because the Buddha actually saw a yogi, not just birth, old age, sickness and death. He asked his car driver, what is that man doing under the tree? So he says, the car driver responds, my lord, he's practicing to take away suffering. And that's when the Buddha wanted to leave home and follow him, because he realized he can be the greatest king, yet he dies. He can be the best of the best, yet his feelings and thinking are just as dualistic as anyone else's. So what can he possibly do? He has to leave the palace. And just like I said before, you do not have to cut the outside hair. Likewise now I say, do not leave your outside home, unless you have very strong Sunim's karma. If you have very strong Sunim's karma, you already know, you have to go. But if not, don't be sad. There is a need for enlightened society. And you can practice to achieve that. So leave your mind home, inside. So what is the walls of your mind? The walls of your mind are your fixed views your ideas, your beliefs. And this is the home that you have to leave behind to wake up. This wall is made of your attachments. Your attachments to your idea of self. Attachments to your views on right and wrong. And based on that, we form not only families, we form tribes, nations, alliances, continents, and these views are piling up, and they are written down, and they are codified, and they are sanctified, and we make war. Based on these views, we make war on each other. So why don't we take them all away? Why don't we transcend them? Why don't we call it a day and say, okay, from now on it will be different. From this moment onwards, we consider all of this as illusory. Why can't we do that? Because we still believe in them. We still believe in them. We do not know anything higher or better than our own ideas and our own feelings. That's why practice is like really going into the forest, into the wild, into the unknown. And this unknown this unchartered territory of your consciousness is strange. When the Sutra says attainment with nothing to attain, it's very hard to grasp it. So many times we are attached to our suffering because we know it. We attach to our notion of self and the world because we are so familiar with it. And since you know it, 
you feel secure in it. It doesn't matter to most people that we will die one day, but now I live in the way I want. It doesn't matter that the world is suffering, I have a little habit that where I keep things more or less in order. So we don't want to change the pattern. We do not want to change the whole system. We do not want to change the entire foundation of our minds because we are so familiar with it and it works more or less. Sometimes we feel really bad, but sometimes we feel very good. So because of these sh short bursts of happiness, we do not follow the path. We do not follow the way. And Earth has reached a threshold. And that's the threshold that we have to see. It's no longer our own individual ignorance that is the biggest problem to tackle at this point, of course. It's us who we have to fix. But our common karma or human group karma has reached a threshold, the sustainability of life on this earth as we know it. Seven billion of us are here. Seven billion. Twenty-five years ago, only six billion. Around the, the First World War, only three billion. Two hundred years ago, only one billion. It goes exponentially, just like that. But the Earth does not grow exponentially. Do we have exponentially more water, air, arable land? We don't. Yet we do not realize what we are doing. And as we see human karma, we will not realize it before we hit a wall. A wall of peace of war, a wall of sustainability or famine and deprivation. Looks like human beings do not learn from anything else than crisis. Even that is very temporary. If we learned from war, we would never make one again because we would remember. But we so quickly forget. A couple of new generations and we forget. And we believe that our war is more righteous than those wars that happened before and actually we can win. We can win this one, and after that, this is the last one, so after that we will have eternal peace. All heroes who stole countries and hundreds of millions of lives, all those heroes said that. And there were millions who believed them. So that's how we perpetuate suffering, and it goes on and on and on. Can we stop that? Not entirely. Can we reduce it? Yes, we can. How? We have to become more clear in our minds, in our speech, in our action. And if we become more clear, if we transcend our illusions, if we come back to reality, then we do not have to exceed these thresholds of crisis, either individual or family or the whole earth. You know exactly what your father or mother really dislike. And when they snap, or there's a shouting match in the family, and most, most likely we don't want to go there. We don't want to exceed that threshold. The problem is that Mother Earth does not have a voice to cry. She would be crying a long time. We don't hear that. We don't see the suffering of all beings around us, not even another human being, let alone animals or plants. So can we completely take suffering away? No. We cannot, because it comes from human existence, that we are born, grow up, get old, sick, and die. And we have a mind that wants peace, perfection, tranquility. This is a big, big contradiction. We can never become free from that. But one thing we can do, we can wake up. We can wake up to the mind that is beyond birth and death. And while in this body, we can change our ways of thinking, feeling, speaking, and acting. 
In that way we can reduce our suffering to the basics of this life, that we are actually born and we will die. That's something we cannot take away. Everything else we can. We can take away wars, famine, uh, any kind of man-made suffering. It's still a very big job. So, the Buddha's teaching was what I call a quiet revolution in the mind. And the revolution of the minds, when you actually start to challenge the most basic views, this revolution goes into social evolution. Society cannot have a constant revolution. I come from a country you know, which was part of an ideological system called socialism or earlier communism, where they tried permanent revolution. That means society was never at peace. It was on the fire of ideological righteousness. And many people died, there was famine, and it was very hard to build a sustainable country. And in some cases, it is this constant agony for many years. You don't have to look too far. It's right here in your, in your neighborhood. It's your own brothers and sisters. So, the mind's revolution, the mind's awakening, results in the evolution of society. Society can develop. Society can become better. If you look at certain societies where they practice something, maybe they are Buddhists, or maybe they are very developed, uh, clear-minded followers of other traditions, the level of enlightenment, how much suffering we make, you know, they are converse. That means if we are more enlightened, we make less suffering. But for that we have to wake up. And that's why the way to end suffering, the, four no the fourth noble truth, yeah, you can say it's the Noble Eightfold Path, but it's actually just one way. Wake up. Practice the path and wake up. Now, in the near future, within our lifetimes, all of us here will get to see the next one or two decades, for sure, unless something major happens. But we will see some thresholds being crossed. The threshold of food, water, and peace, in many cases, many areas of this world. And then we should be ready to help. If we do not, the suffering can get prolonged for a lot longer than otherwise. That's why in our minds we should change the views, we should wake up to reality, and when that happens, we can form groups and more enlightened societies than before. So when do we wake up? And the answer is, when you had enough suffering. And that's a very, very relative term. The Buddha said, there are many kinds of students. One of them is like a good horse. Just moves with the thought of the master. So the master just thinks and the horse turns. The next horse, still very good horse but has to see the shadow of the whip. And if the horse sees that, then understand. If I don't keep my way correct, then my master will hit me. So that turns. The next one is not so good horse, but still listens at the first hit. So you have to hit the horse once. And then the horse suddenly says, Ow! I better behave myself. My master doesn't like my way, so I have to turn when he says so. And the next horse has to be beaten many times, very stubborn. And the last kind of horse has to be beaten until he bleeds. So what kind of human beings are we? Do you follow your completely clear, no-thinking mind? Are you completely one with your true self? Do you really perceive what to do and you do it without checking, holding or wanting? Or you still have some eye and you have to say, oops, if I don't follow then maybe I'll have some problem. Or the problem actually has to appear and hit you once. 
You have to get a nasty phone call once. Or somebody doesn't respond to your phone calls. And then you realize, something's wrong, maybe I made a mistake. Or you have to have many contacts, connections and friends lost. Losing your job, losing your friends, losing everything. Before you wake up. And something's definitely not right. So what kind of forces are we? What kind of human beings are we? And just like there is no manual to life and death, there is no fixed threshold which says from the outside, enough. You have to say that. You have to say that. You have to say how much is enough, how much food is enough, how much water is enough, how many cars are enough in a family, how much money is enough in the bank. If we do not do that soon enough, Mother Earth will throw us off her back in a way that we cannot expect. Otherwise, if we wake up, we can give higher quality to our lives. Why? Because we have given higher quality to our minds. So higher quality of the mind, that means higher quality society. Why can Korea have five times the population of my country, Hungary? on roughly the same amount of land. How come that this is possible? In Seoul alone, there are more inhabitants than the entire territory of Hungary. How can so many people live together? And there is an operational society. People don't fight for food. People earn money and they buy food. And if somebody is poor, they have the soup kitchens. I've seen them. So, the answer is in the quality of the mind. Higher class consciousness, less dualistic thinking, more cooperation. More cooperation possible. So, actually, the level of an enlightened consciousness can be seen, can be measured by the degree of cooperation and compromises that they can make and retaining functionality or even increasing functionality. So, if we improve our minds, if we become more clear, then even 70 billion people could live on this earth. We could use our money in some other way than making stupid weapons. Did you know that one year of the earth's entire military budget would be enough to reforest the entire Amazon or put soil into half of the Sahara, it would be enough for that. We just have to think different. And thinking different cannot be the slogan of just one company. There was a company, and there still is, who said, think different. Does that mean I have to buy your product instead of someone else's? Does that mean think different? Well, we have to go a little deeper. And think different entirely. Completely, And for that, we have to find, absolutely, the root of our thinking, where our thoughts come from, and return to that mind which doesn't know, doesn't think, and doesn't feel. And it's before life and death. Once we have done that, we can think different. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have arrived at the threshold of my talk, which means my introductory is finished. And now comes the more important part, which is your questions. So please, ask your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. system is very simple. You, you raise your hand, you get the microphone, and you ask what you need to ask. That's how it works. How would Margot do Hashi today? No. Not at all. No. 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 No.
you look different today. You look energetic and you look refreshed. What happened to you during the years that we have not seen you? Uh, I slept well last night. <laughs> um, honestly, Bosalim, we have known each other for a long time. And uh, you know when people have a lot of baggage, they can seem very tired and exhausted. I can say that I unloaded mo much of my unnecessary baggage in the last year. And that's why you see what you see. And if you see otherwise at any time, let me know. Okay? Uh, I will come again. <laughs> More, more questions? Anyone? Yes, Bujani. You, uh, you mentioned the uh, enlightened society. Uh, yeah. The, the concept of that is a little bit unfamiliar for me. Usually we say uh, uh, a person is enlightened or something like that, or person seeking enlightenment. But the, uh, by by saying enlightened society is some kind of some uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, theocracy or something like that. Absolutely not. It can be theocratic, like if you look at Bhutan, Bhutan is a highly Buddhist country and they still revere their king almost like God. In Tibet, if they had a country, they would treat the Dalai Lama as their living Buddha or living God, both together. But these societies, especially Bhutan, which can have in its, its own existence, uh, independent of all the surrounding neighbors, they have an index called the Index of Happiness. You know that, right? So this tells you something, that uh, it's basically the relationship between people, both as individuals and groups, and as power and subjects, that defines how we live together. So if I want to be very uh, kind of practical here, I would say look at the constitution of a country plus look at the everyday life of a country. Is there a difference? There is. So the, the less this difference is and the more enlightened this constitution is, that means society is doing really well. Why? We don't make each other suffer. We don't take too uh, many resources from nature. Uh, we don't, you know, exert harm. No, we kill less. All of that. And I can tell you societies that are not theocratic at all, and yet they are as close to this harmonious function and understanding cause and effect deeply. Scandinavia. You look at Scandinavian countries, and of course, you are not Norwegian, Swedish, or Finnish, or you know, Danish. So you don't want to live there so much. But you recognize what these people have done, you know? Just energy. Sweden will take all the family houses, all the private you know, consumers off the electric grid as consumers by 2018. That's how they think. They have solar power, they have other, you know, bio and other powers that will completely eradicate public dependence on big power plants. Germany will proceed to stop their nuclear plants. Uh, so that means our energy need will be a less uh, ruinous kind of source, not, nu <coughs> not nuclear, not coal, so we will inflict less harm and less suffering to the environment to have light bulbs and warm water and food. That's what I call more enlightenment, less suffering. So, look at society. Do we make each other suffer more or less? If we don't make each other suffer, we are more enlightened you know, society. It's, it's very clear. If there is anger, desire and ignorance, this much, that society is a suffering society. If power holders completely oppress the subjects, because they are afraid of losing their power and they're holding on to it. That means that society has not much enlightened consciousness. It's, it's very simple, very clear. Look at it from this point of view. 
you can find it in writing, like the constitution and the laws and, and the way people are supposed to interact. You can find it in the real life of that society, how they actually treat each other. What is the value of life in a, in a society? What is the approach to death? Is it a taboo? Is it sheltered? Is it natural? Is it celebrated? Is it ritualized? So what's our concept of life and death? That defines the enlightened nature of a society. So as close to reality as possible, as close to a harmonious function as possible, as close to the non-harmful effect society. See, we talk about zero carbon footprint when we have uh, various appliances or factories. How about this? Zero human footprint. How about living in a way that we do not inflict so much damage on the environment to reduce the human footprint on Earth? How about that? So there are many ways to look at this, and this, these are just a few. Okay. More questions? Yeah. Yeah, this means question. <laughs> okay, so we there. Um, so, getting enlightenment, the path to enlightenment is like uh, you have to do some practice. Yeah. So, my question is how to do practice? And actually, what I've been doing was. Uh, when you and Hyungak Sunim was in Hageza, yeah. I thought I had a kind of consistent direction on how to practice. Yeah. But with you and Hyungak Sunim were very far away from Korea, and most of the time. Uh, I just would get, read this book, that book, this book, that book, and hear some TV, Dharma talk, things like that. So I think I kind of lost on uh, consistent practice. I so, see. my question is uh, how much, how important is consistent guide from a teacher? And without that kind of uh, situation, how can I keep practicing correctly? Okay. So, that, that, that's my question. Very clear. So, first of all, in our tradition, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, they are all important. So having the Dharma element as uh, books or TV or whatever Dharma talk you get is one. It's important, but it's not enough. Uh, fortunately now, through many means, email, Skype, internet, you can keep in touch with a teacher. Any teacher you want, you can find. If you have a certain uh, connection to a teacher, seek that person out and ask for guidance. Why am I saying this? Because inyon is undeniable. You cannot have studies with just any kind of teacher. You have to have the inyon. If there is no inyon, or yin and yang for the foreigners who may not know that, that's the necessary character's attraction. So those characters have to match. The teacher has to accept you as a student, and the student has to accept the teacher as a teacher. If that doesn't work, the teaching doesn't go in. Why inyon with the teacher is so important? Because you have to believe him or her. If you don't, it goes, bounces back from the wall of yourself. So when that happens, that you find a teacher, stick to that person, as long as you believe him or her. And then the Sangha. So sometimes, I really suggest, like once a week, you go up to a temple, any kind of temple where you feel good, and you do some chanting, so that you would practice together with others. Just once a week. It's no big deal. Here in Korea, you have hundreds and thousands of operational temples, even in the smallest you know, village or, or countryside. It's beautiful. And what is important, that you share the Dharma with others by chanting, or even bowing, or a little bit of chansang. And then the next step, I'm not giving you too much homework, that's the last step, uh, is practicing at home. So, 
My uh, modest experience in this field is that if you do not do individual practice, something is missing. If you do not do group practice, something is also missing. So the key is the balance between the two. If you do only group practice, then your center is not strong enough to do individual practice and you don't get down to business with yourself. You don't see how you practice by your own effort without anybody helping you just by being there. The other extreme is practicing only individually. Then your I, my, me can actually grow stronger. My view, my practice, my meditation, my, my, my. Also not so good. Okay? So the best is the middle way between the two. So do individual practice at home and I'm sure your wife and children will understand that daddy wants to be alone for half an hour. In many families they don't understand that. Especially with young children. Where is daddy? Daddy wants to be quiet, but I want to be with him. Listen, daddy wants to be quiet. I don't understand. So, uh, this, is, this is something that you have to work out. It's not easy. Living in a home, and Korean homes are very populous. That means that there are not just one or two people there. And there's family life going on. So family life sometimes means that you have to get up a little earlier and do some morning meditation, because that's the only time, unless you live alone or with just your spouse, that you can do that. So, I really truly believe that individual practice and group practice, a teacher and the teaching together, this gives you the blueprint for practicing well. And that I sincerely hope. For both individual practice and group practice, yes. I still need a teacher. Yes. So, at home, where is the teacher? Well, again, sometimes you visit the teacher in person. We have a global village and at least once a year you can go pretty much anywhere you want. And then the rest of the year you can keep in touch with the teacher in any possible way. Now we can have video conferencing, come on. So, it's so easy. In the Buddha's time, Mahakashyapa had to come back three days on foot when the Buddha died. He just couldn't get the news. There was no paging or texting or anything like that. In other words, find your teacher and keep in touch with that person. Let's say you, you are my teacher, you are in Hunger. So I go to Tempo. Then Tempo, then I have a snake. Yeah. Then those two things may not be the same way in practice. I can direct you to very good sunims here in Korea and that will be no problem. Okay? And then, if you like, you go to Tap Hong Kong and go by airplane <laughs> to Hungary. And you can visit Wong Kwang Sa and have a wonderful time. We practice together. We even have kimchi. kimchi <laughs> 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 So, uh, this is all possible. Okay. More questions? Yes, back there. Thank you for Yeah, I should do that. Reluctant mind. Oh, that's very good mind. Actually, 
선수원 하다가 어제 부모한 하기 싫은 마음이 들어서 그냥 해버리지 않았습니다. 그러니까 마음속에 어, 죄책감, guilty. Guilty? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Reluctance, guilt. Very good friends. <웃음> 네. 그래서 이런 마음이 들때 어떻게 그것을 극복해서 계속 하던 생을 계속 빠지지 않고 할수 있는지 그게 우선 첫 번째 질문이고요. Okay. So how to take away this reluctance and guilt, right? Open your window. Open your window and look out. Look out and see what you really have to see. And not just, hmm, human beings or cars or whatever. Observe. Observe. That person going, going, going. And ask the questions. Where does she come from? Where does she go? Where do I come from? Where do I go? Do I know that? Reluctance is gone. If you want to follow a form, that's sometimes the birthplace of reluctance because nobody really wants to sit like this too long. Or nobody wants to do back palde every day, 108 bows. That's also understandable. But who would not want to wake up? So if you are reluctant to follow a form, don't follow it. But never lose your question. Never lose your huadu. Never lose your sincere inquiry why you are here. Still, the better part of your life is ahead of you. What will you do? Don't answer me. Answer yourself. If you know it, if it's clear, then meditation is not necessary and you can go about your life and help other people. But mostly we don't know. We deeply don't. So then, reluctance is gone. Because time is of the essence. Time is very precious. Probably that's why that, that it's good that our life is so short. Imagine you could be lazy for 200 years. We don't have 200 years. We have maybe, maybe 70 or 80 years. And face it, out of that, how many years are useful when you can really practice? Very few. 30, 40? By the time you understand the Dharma, you are over your 20s. The Buddha was 28. So how long can we really practice before this body breaks down? We are between the barriers of the mind's realization, the mind's trip out of the palace, and the body's condition to practice. So between the first and the last, it's not much time. It's very quickly passing. So then, if you look at this, just look at cause and effect. Look at the way this world operates in front of your house, your window. You really see that your reluctance is gone. And your guilt is gone too. That's the good news. <laughs> okay. More questions? To, to watch it all? Okay. Your mind and chill is... <laughs> 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 yes, uh, I'm... Uh, what kind of religion your grandmother? I understand she's not Buddhist. That's good. Okay? Understand? Uh, she doesn't have a religion. Oh, if your English is so good, then speak, <laughs> speak English, please. You know why? For the recording. You know, this is better. Please. Uh, sometimes she said to me that she, uh, I feel that she is very afraid of death. Uh -huh. And I, I, I know the Buddha's teaching, but she doesn't know any. Okay. She doesn't know that. But it, I cannot explain uh, Buddhism, but I, I want to help my mother to calm down. And, and also, actually, I want to uh, know the, what the Buddhism is to her because it is. I think it is the truth. But how can I help her? What do you think is the truth? Uh, as, as you said, the first. Yeah, yeah, taking away suffering or the way there. Yeah. There is no life and birth. Yeah, for your grandmother, I understand it would be very hard to explain that. So, 
find out what your mother believes. Everybody believes something. Does she believe in some religion? No, very good, very good. Does she really believe in cause and effect in the kitchen, like she cooks and then she stirs something, some good food appears? She has to believe something. Now use that. I give you an example. Hungary is not a Buddhist country. And many people are asking about reincarnation, but it's only in here. They want some ideas in their heads. And I said, don't think about reincarnation in the way you do, because it's not correct. It, it didn't come from any experience. It didn't come from deeper practice. So I'm not giving you any thoughts. I give you an example. So get two cups. Put it before your grandmother. Two very simple cups. One is filled with water. The other is empty. And you take one cup and you say, Mom, this is your body and mind together. Your body is the cup, your mind is the water. When you die, this breaks. And then the water goes into the next one. Like that. That simple. And then she says, how do you know? I said, then you can say, Grandma, have you seen dead people? They're not moving, they're not talking, they don't have any feelings, they don't see, hear, or taste, or smell, or touch. They cannot do that. Why? Because their minds are missing. The water is missing from the cup. So if the water is there, it's complete. We call that sentient being, a body and a mind together. When the mind is missing, it's just a quickly decomposing body. Very quickly, go to the dump site, to the garbage, to cemetery, to crematorium, wherever you die. Most people on this earth don't get a funeral, did you know that? If you get a funeral, you live in a civilized country. If your body is buried, you live in the top 20% of this earth. So tell your grandma there's nothing to be afraid of. She should really understand what is the cup, what is the body, and what is the mind. And usually when people get older, they cannot learn so much anymore. So just tell her as much as she can understand. Her peace of mind is more important than the knowledge that you, that you can give her. Okay, so go as far as you can, but not, not push. More questions? Any kind of question is good. Harmony question, Harabuji question, Buddhist question, non-Buddhist question, anything. Uh, do I really uh, 
to accumulate bad karma from this my activity. Okay. Very good question. Very honest. Yeah. Uh, like I said, being born on this earth is suffering to all beings, including the insects. What you do primarily, the primary activity, is not killing insects. So you do not go around with a spray gun all day killing insects. You produce food, right? That's very important. So producing food is your primary activity and the collateral damage is killing insects in the process. You produce food to feed your family or other human beings. That's number one important. So that's the biggest amount of your karma, of your primary focus. That's good. So your intention is not to kill, but it comes as a necessity to be able to grow food. So you can do two things. First of all, I have to kind of calm down your mind if you're worried about your bad karma, because it's very little. Yes, we have to kill to grow food. It's, it's true. But, A, it's not intentional. Two, it's not that large amount compared to killing animals or killing human beings. Why? The higher level the consciousness is, the worse the karma is. So killing human beings is a lot worse than killing insects. For one, you get executed or put to prison you know, for life, that's human beings. For insects, you get a little bad feeling. This shows our value system. It's not good to kill insects, but it's far less of a crime than killing a human being or in some other societies an animal. Why? I always wondered why. That's a sentient being. That's a sentient being, human. Both have a body and a mind. So what's the difference? The difference is the level of consciousness. How individual it is, how complex it is, how close it is to us. It's a little bit a selfish view, I know that. But still, we judge these things. You smile so beautifully at this. So, we judge these things based on a human standard. And this human standard cannot be eradicated. Face it, it's there. So what can you do? First of all, you see that in your mind you don't want to kill these insects, but you want to feed humans. Second of all, you can reduce the amount of insects on your plantation if you plant it around with the co corresponding correct plants. Uh, it's actually a very smart way of uh, producing food because you plant those plants that those insects hate. Inside the plantation, there is actually what you want to grow, and insects like that. But if you plant it around with a natural fence, then there are far less insects going in. That's number one. Number two, since you still have to kill insects, no matter how smart you are, you have to chant for them. So chant for the, even the little, teeny little bit of consciousness that those insects are losing, you have to chant for them to take even that karma away. So, reducing the material, you know, necessity to kill those insects. And, in the Dharma realm, putting some energy to the consciousness to appease them, to bring peace to their little minds, then you can, you can really take this karma away and not have to worry about it. Okay? Sorry. Thank you. You're very welcome. It's okay. More questions? Maybe last few questions and then we go to Tiro. Yeah. Concert? Concern. 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 Okay. Uh, I have been um, doing practice uh, for my uh, true self, following my true self. Uh, actually, uh, I, I, I already mentioned that before, 
purified uh, email I had uh, concerns so but when I came here and listened to your Dharma talk, I realized that I missed uh, the, the thing. That means that uh, I missed to where the thought, the concern, come from. After hearing your press Dharma talk, uh, I thought that uh, uh, I missed to one important the lesson. So, unfortunately, I have the good way to cope with uh, this concern. So thank you for your uh, precious Arnato and that uh, if you have any uh, advice to give me and uh, I am uh, asking you <laughs> Yeah, uh, first of all I have to congratulate you, you have only one concern <laughs> I still have many <laughs> But uh, actually, once you realize that you do not practice just for your own peace or for your own clarity, then your question never fades, your practice never extinguishes. So once we realize how deeply we are connected as human beings, that our minds are actually completely one, although the bodies are completely separate, that will give you sufficient motivation never stop practicing. So, my only one advice to your only one concern is that never stop practicing. So, always see the reason why make one more step. Always see the reason why you are practicing right now. That's why we have the three refuge. That's why we have the four great vows to keep that motivation alive. But really see it inside that once you are okay, then everyone else should and can benefit from your practice, from the mind that you display or make present every single moment, wherever you are. Okay? Continue. Okay? Yeah? Sure. Uh, actually, uh, I was given a lot from my parents, so this time I want to give a lot back to my parents as a tribute. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it's been one year since I have my job, and nowadays I am looking for another uh, job. Yes, but, uh, my parents uh, are old, are getting old, so uh, I want to show what I want to give them uh, as uh, some kind of um, but the time is uh, limited for me getting a job and to show and to help them because of that burden uh, even though I spend my whole time on doing and for getting a job or for doing something um, so before I came here uh, I didn't know uh, how to cope with this difficult situation that is uh, corrected with the first part well, you have brothers and sisters right? How many? My sibling is uh, uh, with the brother and with the sister. So you have two siblings? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Do they have a job? Yeah, they have a job, but... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. So they have a job. But they didn't get married. Oh, that's another point. They didn't get married, but they have a job. So, my, my point is here, you can help your parents in many ways in ways that your siblings cannot. So they have a job and if necessary they can support your parents financially or materially. But if they are busy, they cannot be with them. So since you don't have a 9 to 5 job, a fixed, you know, employment, you can spend more time with your parents. Sometimes that's all they need besides normal life. That's all they need, that they could see their children, even if just one, but more regularly. Because many times when there's a job, or there is marriage, or both, and there are children, they say, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. Mom, I'm sorry, Dad, I'm sorry. Well, children cannot make up for their obligation, for their unha, as you say, by saying, I am sorry. It's not enough. They have to be there. They have to be present. So, 
If I understood your question correctly, then you can give more to your parents even though you don't have a job, but you can be there, you can share some time with them. But one thing that my parents want me to do is not be with them, uh, but the, they want me to be live happily and getting a job or getting a high salary or not to live in apartments. Mm -hmm. So actually, if my parents want me to do that, I really want to be with them, but but I want to follow their hope. I understand. So we just run into a little bit of a Confucianist problem here. How much the parents determine the children's lives? And uh, coming from a kind of more or less individualized society, because Europe is in between America and Asia in that regard, a little bit to the western side, but still we have more of a fa familial control over children's life in America. Um, I can tell you that you cannot live your parents' dreams. I couldn't live my father's dream. I had my own life and my own path, which I had to follow. First find, then follow, then even fight for it, and then see that this is it, and then you do it. In your life, your parents can have hopes, aspirations, many things that they can give you. But you cannot do exactly what they want. It's true that they are people who know you ever since you were born, but they know you from your parents' perspective. So your father cannot give up the father's perspective, or the mother the maternal perspective on your life. And sometimes that's why you feel completely caged. And mom, I'm not like that. Dad, I'm not like that, you know? We have to fight many times, and of course we want to do this very nicely, but the ultimate answer is that we become independent. So if you are already in an independent position, you can visit your parents back. If you're not yet independent, which of course is not the case, then you must become independent. It's a general rule. Only by an independent basis you can cooperate. Otherwise it's an annexation, not a cooperation. So, yeah, you may not have a 9 to 5 job, so if your parents want you to do that, and also you want to have that, then no problem. But if you don't want to have a 9 to 5 job because you want to be a volunteer, or a charity worker, or do something more beneficial, hypothetically, then you have to follow what your heart truly believes in. And if you truly follow what your heart believes in, you will be happy whether it's a fixed employment or not. And if you're happy, then your parents will also be happy. If you're not happy, then your parents are also not happy. So, ultimately they will understand, even the toughest father will, will understand that their dreams are not the son's lives. So they have to see the children follow their own way. It's very painful. Okay? So you do what you believe in, but you must do it. And once you do it, then there is some result. And if you believe in that, if that makes you happy, then your parents will accept it. You. You're welcome. My parents are not tough. Maybe they, maybe they should be a little tougher. <laughs> okay? Yes, one more. One more, yes. Go ahead. This question, <laughs> uh, this question is about practice. Um, uh, sometimes my practice is really good, and sometimes it's really terrible. Um, but for instance, um, this year I started meditating regularly, and um, I've been meditating for about three months now. But if I go to a typical state, like a long retreat, and do a lot of meditating, I feel like, oh, my practice is really strong, maybe too strong, because the next week I don't meditate much at all. Anyways, I feel like my practice is on a seesaw. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I know that you know, good and bad are not real. 
the same thing. But I'd like to know how, if you ever feel like your practice is a seesaw, if your practice is ever tricky, and how, how do you deal with it? Great question. So let me ask you, how much do you see that your practice is on a seesaw? Do you see it completely? No, I just think. Well, I can't literally see it on the seesaw. Oh, I, I don't mean to be attached to the metaphor. What I mean is, do you perceive in your mind that sometimes you want to practice and you do it, or you don't want to practice and you don't do it? Do you perceive that? Yes. Great, because then you can overcome that. So, original practice doesn't depend on form. Awakening doesn't depend on technique. So, keep practicing no matter what, because once you have the taste of freedom, the mind's freedom, don't try to extinguish that encouraged or fiery intention to follow that. Because that's the fire of the Dharma, it's not some desire. First of all, it's desire. It's like the first stage of a rocket. You want to get enlightened, it's desire. It's okay. It puts you in orbit. Orbit is regular practice. But once you're in orbit, sometimes around, around, around your self. So that's also okay. And I can tell you, terrible practice is the best practice. You know, nobody complains when they clean the kitchen and they reach the dirty corner. And they say, oh my god, this kitchen is really dirty. Well, that's why you are cleaning it. Sometimes you see things in your mind that completely devastates you. That's not me. I cannot believe that's in my consciousness. It's the best practice. Because as long as the sun is shining on your strong practice, that's actually a little bit of a delusion. It's not bad. It gives you the joy of the Dharma. But this joy of the Dharma is actually a reflection. It's already an emotional reaction to things, or the company, or the meditation that is very harmonious, very clear, and very so. And you need it. Just don't think that the terrible experience of practicing when you don't want to sit, and, and there's so much tension inside, so much passion, or suffering, or even the will to destroy or exterminate, that's not bad. You have to see it. You start practicing, what do you expect? You see the dark side of your character. If you go around the moon, you see the dark side of the moon. Not just the shiny side. And without that experience, your progress is incomplete. So don't be afraid. That's why I ask, do you really see when you have a terrible time? Or when you don't want to practice? That's already practicing. Sometimes you feel bad enough that you don't want to sit in lotus because I don't give a shit! You no, know, this kind of mind appears. Very good. Perceive that. Don't run away from it. Don't start to watch some television, you know, because you want to run away from it. You have that mind, live with it. Perceive it. And once you have perceived it, you build up a distance. Like the painter who keeps painting, 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 is a oh my god, what am I painting? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? So you put down the brush, you put down your willpower, and you make one step back. And you ask, what is this really? What am I really? And stay with that question and don't refuse the movie that you see. Don't refuse the vista of your karma. Because once you do that, you are not the actor in a movie. You become the spectator first, the audience, then you realize that the audience is the director. You make that. But if you are always projecting yourself into the movie, into some action, into some karma, into some name and form, into some like and dislike mind, you can never perceive. That's why I said perceive. Whether you love it or hate it, perceive it. For what it is. And then, when the director sees, oh my god, I'm doing the whole thing. I am making this whole thing. Then you can get into the projector room and turn it off. And that's this point. Completely before thinking.
completely before appearance and disappearance. And that's important. Not whether you like it or not, whether you have a great time or not. Many times you can see statues, especially in Theravada, the Arahant statues, they are sitting, this, this kind of face. Suffering or even screaming expression. I've seen it with my own eyes in, in, a, in a private collection in Singapore. It was, it was not this happy Buddha, you know, completely sitting in a golden position, this very happy Mahayana concept. And many times the Arahans don't have it. And I asked, you know, I looked at it, I was a very young monk, and I said, why aren't these people suffering? They're skinny like this, ascetic. They're supposed to be free from suffering. So why aren't they this, this complete, sometimes even distorted face? Because they experience the last vestiges of their karma. It's actually the moment before awakening. Look at the Buddha. The Buddha experienced the temptation of Mara's daughters, the temptation of uh, becoming a great warrior by rising against the host of demons, you know? So his married karma, like the royal lineage, and his warrior karma came as the last vision, and that's not pleasant. I don't mean to qualify where you or anyone is in their practice. This is not about that. What this is about is really don't be afraid of your unfinished karma. Don't be afraid of your unseen characteristics. You are not the good person you believe you are. But you are not the bad person either that you believe you are. Your true self is beyond good and bad. Your true self is beyond birth and death. It's only your karma what you see. It's just the movie, but it's not the light which makes this movie live. So let the movie run out. Perceive this clear original light which is in your mind, which is actually the substance, the essence of all these projections. Let the movie run out. That's why if you perceive, you practice. It doesn't matter whether you sit in lotus or not. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, unless there is any further and pressing questions, I would love to finish it now with appreciating your attention, your wonderful eyes and ears being present at this Dharma talk. And I hope that we can share the Dharma later, either in Korea or in Hungary, Wangwangsa, which I hope many of you will be visiting in the near future. So thank you all. Wish you wonderful health and wonderful mind and motivation to progress on the path to save all beings from suffering by our awakening. Thank you.